This is a bombshell and this is something where the impact is going to be reverberating around the globe for a variety of reasons. Shocking allegations about once beloved music icon P. Diddy, culminating in what could be his complete fall from grace. I can't see how he gets out of this. I just can't. But there's a lot to unpack over more than three decades. So let's take a closer look at the complete timeline of allegations against P. Diddy and what we could see moving forward. Wow, this is really big. This is really big because you're thinking about this huge mogul, like everyone knows who Puffy is, who Diddy is, who Puff Daddy is, who Sean Combs is. No matter what his name, you know who he is. Who he is is 54-year-old Sean Combs, a rapper, label executive, and entrepreneur who, as previously alluded to, goes by many names. He first rose to fame in the 90s after creating the record label Bad Boy Records. That represented artists like The Notorious B.I.G. or Biggie Smalls and Faith Evans. But it's recent allegations dating back to those early days that find Diddy under fire. With all of the allegations that have come forward and come forth at this juncture, um, all the artists that have come forward alleging wrongdoing, I can't see how he gets out of this. I just can't. That's former prosecutor Melba Pearson, who's followed Diddy's career since the 90s. Back then, there weren't any public allegations against him. You know, to, to compare him to R. Kelly, for instance, there were rumors swirling around R. Kelly from the beginning, and, and that started off with his marriage to a very underage Aaliyah, and that's when folks were like, hmm, okay, something doesn't seem right here, but like kind of put it to the side, just kind of put a pin in it for a few decades until all the bombshell allegations and well ended up being proved in, in a court of law came for, you know came forth I, I feel like with Diddy we didn't hear that much we knew that he partied hard we knew that he was always going to high profile events and all of that but I personally have never heard any rumors surrounding uh, any wrongdoing or anything having to do with him so that's what was so stunning when Cassie Ventura filed her lawsuit earlier this year it kind of broke the dam and it was just the floodgates opened and all of these other allegations started to come to the surface because that generally is what happens. You have one survivor brave enough to come forward and then other people feel empowered and then they come forward with their stories, which is exactly what we have seen here. We'll get to Cassandra Ventura soon, but keep in mind her lawsuit brought forward some of the first allegations against Diddy in November 2023. That's also when we heard from Liza Gardner, whose alleged sexual assault happened in 1990. According to her civil suit against Diddy, Liza met him at an event in New York where he got handsy, but it was at an after party where she, quote, was offered more drinks and was coerced into having sex with Combs. Liza says Diddy raped her and her friend that night. Days later, Liza alleges Diddy came to the place where she was staying. He was, quote, irate and began assaulting and choking Liza Gardner to the point that she passed out. The next year, 1991, Diddy allegedly raped another woman, Joy Dickerson Neal. Joy also filed suit against Diddy in November 2023, but says she met him three decades prior while she was a student at Syracuse University. The pair had mutual friends, and Joy actually appeared in one of Diddy's music videos. When they finally went out on a date, Diddy allegedly, quote, intentionally drugged her, resulting in her being in a physical state where she could not independently stand or walk. After that, she alleges Diddy raped her and recorded it all on video. She found out about the video days later when a friend revealed he'd seen it. Joy's lawsuit states she felt confusion, pain, embarrassment, and shame. So she did not go to the hospital or report the assault to the police and sought refuge in her apartment, avoiding any outside contact. Joy now demands a jury trial, something I asked law and crime legal analyst Julie Rendelman about. It's interesting. One would argue that a, an individual that says, I refuse to settle outside of court um, and want a child to be heard is because they want uh, themselves to be heard. Uh, they want people to understand that they were victimized by this individual. Um, and they're not just looking, in a sense, for a payoff. 
Um, and so that could be one of many reasons why she's choosing to do that. Meanwhile, as years pass by, Diddy's career is gaining steam. And by the late 90s, Diddy himself begins putting out songs, even snagging his first two Grammys in 1998. But the following year marks the next stop on the Diddy timeline, the New York nightclub shooting. It happened on December 27, 1999 at about 2.55 a.m. A fight broke out at a nightclub in New York City between Diddy, Jamal Barrow, known as the rapper Shine, and this guy, Matthew Allen, who went by the nickname Scar. Three people were shot, though no one suffered any life-threatening injuries. All three men were arrested, as was Jennifer Lopez, Diddy's then-girlfriend. J-Lo's charges were dropped, but both Diddy and Shine went to trial. Diddy was acquitted, but Shine was convicted on charges of attempted murder and criminal possession of a weapon. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Here's Melba again to explain. So I think people were not like horrified per se. I think they looked at it as, well, this is part and parcel of the hip hop industry. I don't think it was very shocking because, you know, there's definitely a perception, somewhat reality as well, that there is violence in the hip hop community and sort of that beef between different groups or different labels. We all know about the East Coast, West Coast beef that was going on during the 90s with Tupac on, on one side, Biggie on the other. So this was something that was uh, an outgrowth of that time frame. So I don't think folks were super shocked at that juncture. Um, I think what was more shocking was sort of Jennifer Lopez's involvement in all of this, because I don't think, even though she was like, yeah, I'm Jenny from the block, I don't think anybody really saw her as really going to be that quote unquote, that chick who is, you know, coming with the, the firearm and is going to, you know, hold it down and ride or die for her man. Like, I don't think people really saw that of her. So I think that was the most shocking part of the case back in 1999. But the fact that Diddy and uh, Shine, who was the art artist who was involved in that incident, the fact that they were charged, I don't think anybody was super stunned. Let's put a pin in this shooting and move on to 2003. This is when Jane Doe says she was raped by Diddy when she was only 17 years old. Along with the others, Jane Doe filed civil suit against Diddy, but says her rape happened 20 years prior. When she was just a junior in high school, Jane Doe says she met one of Diddy's friends at a club near Detroit. After that, he flew her on a private jet to New York to meet Diddy. She says Diddy raped her in a studio there, and her lawsuit includes specific notes about Diddy, saying, quote, he told her that he could not orgasm and asked her to squeeze his nipples as hard as she could to get him off. And while Jane Doe doesn't list her name in the lawsuit, she does list multiple photos of herself and Diddy. Here's Julie again. Uh, what's the reason that anyone who's making an accusation against a high profile celebrity would choose to not have their name out there? One, they're concerned about potential threats against them. They want to protect their anonymity, their privacy. Um, and so it's not unusual that we've seen it. We've seen it on multiple other cases, especially when someone's alleging that at the time that the allegation occurred, they were underage. Um, and so it's it's not unique um, to hear of a Jane Doe suing an individual. And quite frankly, in regards to if there's criminal allegations, you may very well see uh, allegations against various Jane Doe's, Jane Doe 1, 2, 3, which we've seen in prior uh, criminal cases in the past. From there, we fast forward to late 2005 or early 2006, when Diddy met Cassandra Ventura, who would later be known publicly as the singer Cassie. According to her suit, she started working with Diddy when she was just 19 years old, and he was 37. She says Diddy began, quote, almost immediately asserting possession and control over her and inserting himself into all aspects of her career and her personal life. That includes things like forcing Cassie to use illegal drugs and have sex with prostitutes, as Diddy watched or masturbated. She also alleges he recorded many of these interactions. Cassie's lawsuit also states that multiple times each year, Mr. Combs would violently beat Miss Ventura, leaving bruises on her body by hiding Miss Ventura in hotels for days at a time to let her bruises heal. The next stop on the timeline is 2011, when Cassie had a brief flirtatious relationship with rapper Kid Cudi. She says that in 2012, Diddy told her that he was going to blow up Kid Cudi's car and that he wanted to ensure that Kid Cudi was home with his friends when it happened. Around that time, Kid Cudi's car exploded in his driveway. 
From there, we time hop to September 2022, when Rodney Jones, also known as Lil Rod, began working with Diddy. For the next year and a half, Lil Rod alleges he suffered abuse, all at the hands of Diddy himself. Now, according to the lawsuit, Lil Rod lived with Diddy for months at a time. He produced nine songs on Diddy's latest album, The Love Album. Lil Rod alleges he was, quote, the victim of constant, unsolicited, and unauthorized groping and touching of his anus by Mr. Combs. At times, Lil Rod says Diddy touched his private areas without consent and forced Lil Rod to watch him shower or have naked body massages. Lil Rod says Diddy, quote, attempted to groom Mr. Jones into engaging in gay sex. Lil Rod even alleges that Diddy promised him things in order to keep him quiet, like $250,000 to buy instruments, ownership of Diddy's $20 million property in Miami, and even a Grammy for producer of the year. Let's pause this P. Diddy story for a quick second to thank Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring today's Law & Crime news package. It's stories like this that remind you you never know what's going to happen, and the world is an unpredictable place. So when you're hurt, it can be confusing, it can be scary, and you don't really know where to turn. Well, enter Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. You can submit a claim in eight clicks or less on your phone and find out if you have a case. If you do, your injury could be worth millions. In the past couple of months, they've gotten verdicts of $12 million in Florida, $26 million in Philadelphia, and $6.8 million in New York. Also, they have over 1,000 lawyers, so you know you'll be in good hands. So if you're interested, you can start by easily submitting a claim at www.forthepeople.com slash lcnews or by dialing hashtag law, that's hashtag 529 on your phone. All right, let's get back to that story. So Lil Rod's lawsuit takes us back to the 1999 nightclub shooting because he alleges, quote, Mr. Combs' girlfriend at the time, Jennifer Lopez, aka J-Lo, carried the gun into the club for him and passed him the gun after he got into an altercation with another individual. All this mirrors something we've heard before. Not only did Jennifer Lopez allegedly bring the gun to the club, now we're also looking at years later, Cassie coming forward and saying that Diddy forced her to carry a gun with her when they went out to different events. So again, I think that this is more along the lines of when you look at this from a domestic violence lens, from the standpoint of the abuser being very controlling and demanding certain activities to prove loyalty to, uh, you know, basically put yourself in an, a bad situation where only he can be the one to save you, basically. Um, so in seeing that the parallels between JLo's experience and Cassie's experience, number one, it brings more credibility to what Cassie said in her pleadings. But also, again, it causes us to look at Jennifer Lopez and be like some of the comments she made about the end of her relationship to Diddy in terms of, well, you know, there was infidelity and, you know, she kind of skirted the issue a bit. But when you start to look back at your co her comments, you start to think, ooh, were you in a domestic violence relationship with Diddy, much like how Cassie ended up in a domestic violence relationship with him? And experts we spoke to, like former FBI agent Bobby Chacon, say the investigation into this shooting could be reopened. If there's a civil lawsuit that lays out this major allegation, what would it take to reopen an investigation into something that happened 25 years ago? It would take a different look at it. So, so you know, in other words, he was acquitted on state murder charges. Now, federal charges can be different. You can have RICO, you can have a continuing criminal enterprise, you can have... So the underlying acts, the predicate acts, what we used to call them when, we, when I worked RICO cases, your RICO predicate act could be something like that 1999 case, and you can use it as a predicate act. You can... You can bring it up. You can, you know, it, when I worked cold cases uh, of this type, sometimes with time, with the passage of time, people aren't as intimidated and they're not as threatened and they get away from the person who was the threat um, and they feel more forthcoming to testify or to give statements uh, in, 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 in lieu of testimony. But certainly I think that um, that case is going to be part of it. You know, in the aftermath of that, they have witnesses that say he bragged about um, intimidating witnesses, uh, uh, paying off jurors. And certainly when you have that kind of stuff, if you go back and you find that juror that was paid off or jurors, multiple, that may have been paid off, um, certainly that gives you the impetus to kind of come forward and refresh 
those charges on a federal case. So the federal cases will be a little different. The charges are a little different, so it's not double jeopardy. Um, and, and so I think that I think that that case that you mentioned that you cite, I think, is certainly one of the ones they're looking to build into a much bigger, to me, maybe a RICO type case. The next stop on the timeline is November 2023, when Cassie files suit against Diddy in New York. So several of the lawsuits were filed with uh, within the Adult Survivors Act, and that allowed for individuals who had allegations from many, many years before to have almost a look back window, a look back window, I believe it's of one year um, to enable them to file civil lawsuits for cases that normally would have been beyond the statute of limitations. Um, and so Cassie, along with several others, took advantage of uh, that, that short change in the law to enable them uh, to file civil suits against uh, P. Diddy. Cassie's lawsuit was settled in just one day, but the damage may have already been done because the other lawsuits soon followed. If this had been settled without any kind of public involvement, any kind of media coverage, these other people may never have come forward. So by, you know, kind of calling her bluff and saying, oh yeah, yeah there's no way you're going to file this. He did himself a whole lot of damage, but I'm glad because at least now the truth is going to come out and everyone will know who this person is. And now, of course, that kicked everything into high gear in terms of law enforcement involvement and investigations. So as much as this whole thing is, is, is sad and sordid, I'm glad that it's coming out so that more survivors can get the closure that they need and that he can be brought to justice for the crimes he's perpetrated on others. That leads us to March 25th of this year, when search warrants were executed at two of Diddy's properties. Homeland Security investigators raided his home in Homeby Hills, California, and his other on Star Island in Miami. Former homicide prosecutor Bernarda Villalona says the feds were probably looking for something specific. I think the main piece of evidence that they're looking for is video recordings or cell phones or anything having to deal with cameras because from the civil lawsuits that have been filed, specifically the one that was filed by the mail just in February, he states that there are video recordings and that Puffy had secret cameras that were located in the different rooms inside of the home. So by law enforcement recovering those video cameras, recovering laptops, recovering covering cell phones, they're able to investigate and do a forensic investigation into those electronic devices and try to get additional evidence as to a crime that has taken place, which will be able to move along any criminal investigation towards possible charges. The same week the search warrants were executed, Diddy's alleged drug mule, Brendan Paul, was arrested in Miami. We first heard Brendan's name in Lil Rod's lawsuit, where he's listed as Diddy's mule, who allegedly, quote, acquires and distributes Mr. Combs' drugs and guns. He was arrested at the Miami airport while trying to board Diddy's plane. He was charged with cocaine and controlled substance possession and has since been released on $2,500 bond. So, so far, Brendan has only been arrested for possession of a controlled substance, and this is for the narcotics that they recovered, I believe, in one of his bags that was on the airplane where where he was um, stopped in the airport, Miami airport on Monday. So they haven't linked that to Puffy at all. As of now, it's just for the simple possession, which is still a felony. The question that I will have and would I'm curious to see what will happen is that whether they're going to use those charges against Brendan to try to flip him, to try to get him to cooperate against any type of uh, prosecution against Puffy or others. Brendan's attorney released a statement following his arrest, reading, quote, We do not plan on trying this case in the media. All issues will be dealt with in court. According to Bernarda, anyone listed in the civil suits should be lawyering up. What they need to do is get an attorney immediately, and not just any attorney, but a criminal defense attorney with trial experience, experience to know how to manage an investigation, how to manage what the next steps would be, how to manage to try to be proactive in trying to avoid uh, charges being brought against their client or to try to minimize their exposure. But I think they should be preparing 
that they may be called in at least for questioning or to be interviewed by law enforcement, so they should be preparing for that. In the days following the federal raids, we also learned Cassie was cooperating with federal investigators. Um, I expect that she would have, um, because again, if she's telling the truth, then she's going to give any evidence that she has. So in terms of if there's recording she knows existed, right? I mean, she may not have possession of it, but she could be like, listen, in July of you know, 2005, you know, he forced me to do X, Y, Z at, you know, this particular hotel. There may be surveillance footage to show me going in and out of the building. There may be a uh, video that he took of the uh, horrible events that may have happened that day. So now at least law enforcement will know exactly where to look and start to narrow down different timelines and then also speak to other witnesses or maybe other survivors that were present and victimized at another point in time, but they can help corroborate some of what she's saying. And that is going to help put together the case against Diddy, likely for human trafficking, for sex trafficking, narcotics charges, et cetera. It's likely her civil suit and the others led to the federal investigations in the first place. I would think that the feds or law enforcement was investigating from when Cassie's lawsuit was filed, but now they have additional fuel for the fire. So now in reading Little Rod's lawsuit, now we're getting into drug use, we're getting into drug trafficking, we're getting into mules, we're getting into pink cocaine, who knew? Um, and so you're hearing and seeing all of these other allegations that now the feds can be like, okay, now I know I need to look for surveillance tapes. Now I need know I need to look for this this aspect. Now I need to speak to these folks because they were listed in Little Rod's um, you know lawsuit. So for instance, you know Young Miami was one of the people that were mentioned as having been at those parties and may have been forced to do certain things at these parties. So now the feds know to go and speak to Young Miami. We don't know if her path. It, intersected with Cassie's during the time that she was there. She, I don't recall her being mentioned in uh, Cassie's lawsuit. So this is a new person now, a new player that the feds can go and speak to to get evidence and get testimony and then continue to build the case from there. On March 28th, another civil suit was filed, this time against Diddy's son, Christian Combs, who also goes by the name King Combs. Plaintiff Grace Omar Kay, who's represented by the same attorney as Lil Rod, alleges Christian Combs drugged her and sexually assaulted her on a yacht in late 2022. Christian's attorney says the lawsuit is made up of, quote, manufactured lies and irrelevant facts, and they are seeking to dismiss this outrageous claim. But then last week, we heard even more allegations pointing the finger at another one of Diddy's sons, Justin Combs. New filings from Lil Rod allegedly show Justin Combs inside Chalice Recording Studio with a sex worker he'd apparently solicited. Justin's rep released a statement about these allegations reading, quote, Justin Combs categorically denies these absurd allegations. They are all lies. This is a clear example of a desperate person taking desperate measures in hopes of a payday. There will be legal consequences for all defamatory statements made about the Combs family. But these same filings from Lil Rod double down on accusations against record labels like Universal Music Group and its CEO, who are listed as defendants in Lil Rod's suit. According to these new court docs, Lil Rod, quote, personally saw executives from the defendant record label present at the recording sessions during the times that sex workers were present. The attorney representing UMG and its CEO, Lucian Charles Grange, says listing him as a defendant is an attempt to fit a square peg into a round hole. He recently made a new filing, including sworn statements from two executives at UMG who counter what Jones has alleged. All that leads us up to right now, with these startling accusations against Diddy, but no criminal charges. So what's next? I think we'll be looking at definitely narcotics charges because of the fact cocaine seemed to feature very prominently in, in all the legal filings. Um, I think it's going to be around human trafficking or sex trafficking, basically, because again, you're moving people from one state to the other for the purposes of, of you know, sexual gratification, right? And without their consent and, you know, who knows if folks were underage, like, again, we're still all finding out all of the details. So the, again, and the investigation's ongoing, so 
we don't know where this may end. Um, but those are the top charges I'm thinking of. There could be firearms charges, again, depending if guns were brought across state lines and the people who were bringing them were not licensed or something along those lines. So those are the things that I'm thinking will end up showing up in a federal indictment. It'll be the perp walk that'll be covered by every single outlet around the globe. Right. So that is going to be, again, sort of that bombshell moment because it's the culmination of all of these high profile and celebrities and folks coming forward with their testimony. So that's going to be huge. I think it's going to be very much parallel to what we saw with R. Kelly and other celebrities that have been arrested for similar crimes. So I think it's going to be a media circus in a lot of ways. Uh, but hopefully in all of this, the survivors will not get forgotten and will not get lost in the shuffle. They have to be the central focus of all of this. We still haven't heard from Diddy about these allegations in 2024, but in late 2023, he posted this statement to social media, quote, enough is enough. For the last couple of weeks, I have sat silently and watched people try to assassinate my character, destroy my reputation and my legacy. Sickening allegations have been made against me by individuals looking for a quick payday. Let me be absolutely clear. I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. I will fight for my name, my family, and for the truth. As for the federal raids, Diddy's team calls it a gross overuse of military level force, saying there's no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities or the way his children and employees were treated. In response to Lil Rod's lawsuit, Diddy's team says in part, quote, his reckless name dropping about events that are pure fiction and simply did not happen is nothing more than a transparent attempt to garner headlines. We have overwhelming, indisputable proof that his claims are complete lies. Reporting for Long Crime, I'm Sierra Gillespie.